The king often had to travel outside of the capital for official duties such as conducting examinations in other regions, training troops, visiting hot springs, paying homage at royal tombs, ancestral worship at shrines, and worshiping at different altars such as the altar of agriculture. As we saw, he also had to meet imperial envoys, and this was the grandest procession of all. There were hundreds of soldiers taking part in these outings. Some soldiers were deployed at key points to prevent potential ambushes from bandits. The king had an orchestra with him, as well as civil officers and royal family members. Of course, many onlookers were lining up the roads, and some even had a chance to interact with the king himself if they had grievances. The king always brought with him his great seal and his title mandate from the Chinese emperor. The procession had many different ceremonial banners, swords, spears, and many other ceremonial objects. The king rode a palanquin, borne by a dozen men. There were large folding screens and fans in the front and behind the palanquin. The king mobilized his troops for two types of training. One was the Great Review, which took place once a year, and another was the Great Hunting Ceremony, and it took place twice a year. For the Great Review, the troops were deployed into five commands, which reflected the five primary elements, water, fire, wood, metal, and earth. The five units were the center, the front, the rear, the left, and the right. Troops were coordinated with battle flags, drums, and gongs. The reviews could have up to 30,000 soldiers at once on the field. This was a serious affair. The banners used were the yellow dragon, which represented the center, the blue dragon, the east flank, the white tiger banner, the west flank, the vermilion sparrow, the south, and the dusky warrior, the north. Drums signaled a call to attack and represented positivity. Metal gongs signaled an order to stop or retreat, and it represented negativity. A blue and a white army would meet and engage in attack and defensive exercises. The great hunting ceremony was a time for the king, the crown prince, meritorious subjects, and generals to show their prowess with a bow and on horseback. Soldiers would surround a mountain and chase wild game towards the king's location. The king and his guests would then shoot their arrows at the game. The arrow's point of entry determined where the game's meat would end up. High shot kills were offered in royal ancestral ceremonies, middle shot kills were offered to state guests, and the low shot kills were sent to the royal kitchens. Later in Joseon, Less importance was given to military exercises as the Confucian philosophy stressed that a cultivated mind and character was more important than military prowess. Although it must be said that the six arts of the scholar gentleman were ritual, music, calligraphy, mathematics, archery and horsemanship. To be a refined yangban, one should be adept at the very least with a bow. Many Korean heroes like Dong Myung, Jumong, were master archers on horseback. Kings would practice archery on palace grounds or near the capital. Tejo, the founder of the Joseon dynasty, was renowned to be a master archer. Sejo had a poem written about his archery skills. The formal archery ceremony, De Sarie, was Joseon's most important archery event. The king demonstrated his skill with a bow at such an event. His bow was red and made of a rhinoceros horn. Like all events in which the king participated, there are records of this ceremony. It is written that Jung Jong and Yong Jo hit the target three out of four times. Jong Jo hit the target almost every time. Music accompanied the competition. A drum sound was a hit, a gong was a miss. The king shot at bear's drawings on a red background, while guests shot at an elk's drawing on a blue background. Joseon was an agrarian society. 
The majority of its population were farmers. Believe it or not, the king himself participated in plowing and harvesting ceremonies. The king performed a plow in person ceremony with the common folk. He showed them how to till the soil and plant seeds. Later, he would participate in the mow in person ceremony. He performed rites to the gods of agriculture, grain, and sericulture. There was an altar of agriculture and an altar of sericulture in the capital. The king would participate in these events with the crown prince and some yangban and commoners. All this followed a strict code of ritual and colors. The nine different grains the king would plant or begin to plant to show the example were millet, barnyard millet, glutinous millet, rice seedlings, rice grains, soybeans, red beans, barley, and wheat. When it was over, the workers were rewarded with makkoli and beef soup with rice called sanongtang, meaning first farmer's soup. This dish is at the origin of solongtang, oxbone soup. The grain planted and reaped by the king himself in state-owned land in Kegyong and Hansong were used to pray for good fortune and be thankful to royal ancestors for bountiful harvest. What the king wore depended on the occasion and the place. An ancestral rite, wedding, military training, receiving the Chinese emperor's envoy, sleeping, etc. The Myolyu Guan and Gujang Bok were called the great ceremonial wear, Derye Bok. It was the most formal wear the king wore. The Derye Bok was worn when an imperial envoy came, when sacrifices were made to royal ancestors, or when attending royal weddings and coronations. The Myolyu Guan had Ryu, strings of gemstone beads attached in the front and back. It symbolically prevented the king from seeing wickedness. It also had cotton wads attached to it on the left and right sides. This symbolically prevented the ruler from hearing wickedness. The Gujang Bok had nine emblems that symbolized the Joseon's king's vassal status. The Chinese emperor had 12 emblems. The king wore Pe Ok, a pair of jade ornaments that hung on each side of his waist. He also carried a ritual jade tablet called Gyu. The Gujang Bok had two main parts, the Ui and the Sang. The Ui, upper robe, had five emblems, dragon, mountain, flame, pheasant, and a tiger and monkey combination cup. The Sang, or lower robe, had four emblems, aquatic grass, rice grain, axe, and back-to-back -back bows. The top had five emblems, a odd number, and symbolized yang. The bottom had four emblems, an even number, and symbolized yin, called um in Korean. The dragon represented the king's absolute authority. The mountain represented awe, like when we're gazing upward at a majestic tall mountain. The flame stood for brightness. The pheasant represented elegance. The tiger and monkey combination represented valor and wisdom. Aquatic grass adds elegance to the patterns. The rice grain stands for bringing nourishment. The axe symbolizes the king's power over one's life and death. The bows represented the king's role as the one leading the people on the right path. For less important formal events, the king wore a Wan Yu Guan coronet and Gangsa Po robes. The Gangsa Po was similar to the Gujang Bok, but lacked the nine emblems and was scarlet in color. The king wore this for receiving other state envoys, but not for imperial envoys. The Ikson Guan coronet and Goyong Po robes were worn most of the time. The king wore this for state affairs discussion in the council halls. The Ikson Guan had cicada looking wings on top. Why? Because it was believed that the cicada only survived on dewdrops 
and that symbolize integrity and frugality, two important characteristics for being a good Confucian ruler. The robes were scarlet, like the Gangsa Po, but had yellow dragons embroidered on the shoulders, the chest and the back. The king's dragons had five claws, while on the prince's robe, the dragons had four claws. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it, comment, and hit the subscribe button. Stay tuned, part three.